Hey there, everybody, and welcome. This is Tevo DRC of Tevo Creative Leadership, the Apostolic Ministry, Chief Apostolic Training and Doctrinal. Just trying to research what is organic and New Testament First Church Christ following, and what are we really seeing today, practically, some of us. A lot of us have heard a lot, more than we'd ever have imagined, more than our grandparents, more than our mother and father due to technology, due to the explosive information age, but also the apostolic anointing and call over this generation, almost every single house. That means to be have a call from the Lord that you know is from Him directly through your relationship, your pure-hearted relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior. Then you get a deposit of the Holy Spirit, which helps you hear and heed the call of the Father, the gentle call, and you can balance that, and you should, by the basics of discernment, which is, for, to me, James 3.17, that any wisdom that comes from above, which we really need, a lot more of any wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And that's a basic doctrinal fine point teaching. The other one for discernment of voices, because Apostle Paul, Chief Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, wrote, there are many voices in this world, and each one has significance, whether it's your mama's voice, a lying voice, an internal, external voicemail, email voice, your pastor's voice, your own voice, and then the voices of the entertainment, but also the subculture, as well as the uh, occult realm. So all these things take discernment and clarity and time, and the main thing is not to be spooked. The main thing is to keep your peace, not be accusative or afraid. So the other verse, along with James 3.17, for discernment of any wisdom, any counsel, or any ideas or dreams, nightmares, or what your mama said, is supposed to be clarified and purified and directed through James 3.17, if it lines up with that, and also Second Timothy one seven, which is one of my favorites for this, because I used to be very anxious, and pick up you know as a prophetic person, a minister, I'd pick up these feelings and I wouldn't know what to do with them. So this is a great one. That's why you know use these Second Timothy one seven. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He has not given us that means you or me his fear. He doesn't have any. He doesn't want any. But of power, supernatural power, in the midst of all this stuff. And of a sound mind, a peaceful mind, a clear mind, knowing direction. His direction for any given day. We're going to find we have to really take time and carve out our time from our pool of wealthy resources and hearing hearts and caring personalities and also media to really get what God is saying just for you. You have to locate it in your discerner perceiver, your perceiver knower, your knower, and that takes getting used to it, isolation. To me, I'm liking it to a GPS. It can be so helpful. It's not a a formula that it's really a GPS accurate because it's subjective, very subjective, but it can be like a help you. Am I supposed to go that direction or this direction today or do this or do that? And you can avoid a lot of nightmares, more than are being avoided right now. Believe me, I share this on purpose. God is so good, but we don't know who's really talking these days. As Paul said back then, he foretold there are many voices in this world. Each one has significance. Either they represent the Lord and the good, or they represent the dark side and the devil, or one to trust or one not, even in ministry. And so I always say like Paul... Paul himself, he knew his own heart. He wasn't perfect. He was He's a human, a Christian, but not perfect. He said, I'm proud of you noble Bereans because you pick apart my doctrine to see if it's really lining up with the word of God. So I give you my permission as well. That's one reason I don't submit dogma, prophetic dogma. I don't, I present it in a sila. That means you get to pause, think about it evaluate it, see what it really means from the Lord, and then hear from the Lord, and also, does it line up with the Bible, like a noble Berean? So, when we get in with the Lord, we want to hear His heart. We want to hear what's on His might. And if you have a fearful nature, or you're easily bugged, or, or you're not patient, or reactionary, 
then you're going to might have to really work harder at this than a lot more people. You know, the Bible teaches us, Matthew, in the different Gospels, the Beatitudes, which are Jesus Christ's red-letter words, and he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. How can they see God? Will, they, will he stand right there with you? Well, maybe he'll show you something of himself. Moses never saw the whole thing. He had to pass by the backside of the Lord, but I don't even feel that's, you know, a lot of us don't, I don't get that. I just get that it more you'll be able to perceive his nature, his will his counsel, his way, his advice, much more clearly. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall perceive or see God a lot more. You're going to even be able to perceive or see him show up on your behalf and see how blessed you are that you are a, win a winner, not the loser that you always thought you were, your mama said, or your the devil said. Because there's a lot of false counsel out there, even among the true believers, because they really want to hear God, but nobody knows it all. That's why it's so important to not ever create this impression that you're the only one that knows everything, because you're really wrong. And I want to point back to when I started this ministry, God allowed me grace to be born for this season. I've been raised in a contented, godly, not tongue-talking tongue -talking home, but one that was spirit-filled Baptist and minister Presbyterian, all that stuff, because it wasn't known. We didn't have any charismatic teaching. Nobody knew one. It's just they all knew the Holy Spirit. Small, you know, not like moving in the Spirit like today and on TV, but they had that ability to perceive and discern the Word of the Lord, the mind of Christ. That means the way of the Lord for guidance and direction in my father's house, my grandmother, and they were just denominational people. I mean, they were only denominational people. Later, the Holy Spirit started to really flow, and movements came up, which got more involved in that. But, you know, that I'm not talking that. I'm talking basic, simple, let's hear God so that we're not, that we're safe, we're saved, and we can help other people. So we're talking about back in the day. So I grew up sort of pre-all-the-TV media Christian. And then I was able to see when it started. I was there, and I did have the Holy Spirit by then. I accepted the Lord when I was in high school, really, when I was 9, then 12, then really got on fire in the Jesus People Movement. When I, and I really wanted to go God's way every single day from that point on because I was curious. And so I was young, but I was not naive. And I was never poor, but we were not real wealthy. In other words, I never remember feeling lacking in anything. It, life was great. It was middle income, but it wasn't, you know, self-seeking or wealth, wealthy. It was rich because we had faith and we had two parents and grandparents and it was contented and happy home. To me, that's wealth and it's by God's grace because I didn't deserve it. I was in a Petri dish to understand happy home for such a time as this because later I learned the nightmare of a home and I don't want to go there today. So I can identify with the great and the not great. So we, Back in the day before the media, well, there's the Jesus people and all the movements starting. And I remember when Word of Faith, Before and After and Vineyard and all that and different ones, Messianic and all that. And so I got the assignment after I graduated college and I was married, but no children. I was sitting in a Presbyterian church that was born again, that had half of it was sort of like for the Holy Spirit and half was not. But they were very happy, very smart. And I was sitting there in a service when I was about 24 and the Lord said, I want you to study my body, all the different kinds of Christians, all the different kinds of ministries, you know, movements and denominations, <clears throat> all the colors and their doctrine and see what they believe, what they don't like, what they do believe, their worship, their dress and their style and what their pet peeves are, their red flag buzzwords. So I thought that sounds interesting. Well, back when I had first gotten to college, before this, I had sort of made this choice that Jesus was my friend, and I remember being like a you know, flower child, Jesus person, which I love, that dress down, even today. So I was with the Lord one day in my quiet time, as they called it back then, and I was with the Lord at the lake, and all of a sudden, I just felt like, you know, I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to miss God's will for my life. So I'm going to experiment. All I'm going to do is say, God, I want you to lead me every day, 24-7, 365, and I want to get into your perfect will. I had no clue I would ever be doing what I do now or knowing what I know or 
ouching where I've ouched or still feeling the same age, even though I'm not the same age physically. And then going through all sorts of different kind of difficulties with finances and warfare and people that were not true, but also knowing that I had a great heavenly father because I saw him in my non-patriarchal dad, great dad, who's now up in heaven. So I was able to stay, you know what, if there is a man that does it, men aren't all like that. Men aren't all grouchy. Men aren't are, on, are this, not this way. Women, black people are not this way. My family had um, no bias and prejudice, cultural prejudice. And so I remember when my aunt had been a minister's wife, of a denominational sort of upscale minister's wife with four children, and he committed adultery. And we went down to Alabama to get her with the four children, bring her up to our house to live in Virginia at the time. And even though we're small people, you know, small town, we have big hearts. And so they brought her up. And I remember the, you know, just the compassion. But when they came, she was ill. She had a lot of illness, I think a lot of stress. So she had with her the nurse, which was like a nanny, but a nurse more, and a friend and a family member who is black named Helen. And I remember Helen, we lived with Helen. Helen, Helen lived with us, and it was just like a normal, we laughed. I mean, our family can really laugh. We really can laugh. We can be discerning, but we don't take ourselves, we try not to take ourselves, hopefully, so seriously a lot. We try to take the Lord seriously. That's different. That's why I teach like I do at times. But man, when I'm not doing this, I'm a riot. I can really learn how to do it. Laughing is such great medicine and also great fun and also stress relief. It's just a riot. So Helen would be there and Helen chewed snuff back in the day. Helen chewed snuff or whatever it is, chewed tobacco and had snuff. That's it. She had tobacco and she she had a lot of snuff and her favorite snuff was, oh, what was it? I was thinking of it the other day. Helen loved buttercup snuff. So my dad, a Baptist, but a Christian first, a mature, healthy person. It was Christmas time. And even though my dad, you know, Baptists never smoke or drink or go with those who do generally, but they weren't hyper people. They were loving. And so I remember going on purpose with my dad to the little out to a little country store that sold Helen's favorite buttercup snuff. So we got her a gift of a whole lot of the buttercup snuff for her Christmas present. But see, that makes a big impression on a child. It makes a as a Christian, as a who a real Christian is or what they do. She They weren't condoning it. Helen was mature, set in her ways, but they knew that wasn't evil. They knew that it wasn't they weren't religious. So I grew up, I guess, really pampered in the fact that I could be around real Christians. They weren't into the law. They weren't a law unto themselves, Pharisees. They weren't chickens. And they weren't, I don't know, their own, I don't know, they weren't wrapped up in themselves. And so it makes me expect that. I've grown up with an expectancy that a true Christian has some of these same hallmarks, male or female. So we get into abiding relationship theology. That's what this is about. It comes from the heart. It comes from the home. It comes from seeing relationships over time and knowing, you know what? I didn't realize that I didn't grow back up under the law. I didn't grow up that females were chattel, second class citizens, anyone's possessions to be used. I didn't grow up where they were critical of another faith, another religion, another belief, another kind of born again Christian or not. And I they weren't right. They weren't even racist. They were not biased. And I really honor my parents for that, my fathers and mothers. And I just never thought a Christian would be anything else. When I had grown up, it was during the time of the civil rights fighting on the news. And so I was about six when my parents decided the Lord was going to move us from Alabama. Well, my dad had been in the seminary at theological seminary at the Louisville, Kentucky Baptist Seminary, and he graduated, so they were trying to figure out God's will. And I remember they, we went up to see a judge who was an uncle to my mother up in Virginia and felt the leading to go up there. So the judge lived in a part of the county that was very rural, and he lived back in the woods. So my family and I went. I was the only child at the time. and We went out, and I was bored. All the grown-ups were talking business with the uncle. So I went outside looking for something to do. And there I noticed a little house. So I went over to this little house and I saw this young boy who's about my age 
age six. And there he was on the porch. And then I realized, you know what, he's black. And I thought, I've never seen a black person in real life. I just heard about him on TV. And I thought, he looks nice. And when I look back, I think, man, I didn't have any bigotry put in me. I didn't have any stone to throw at anyone. Over. I just thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to gauge him by his peace or being nice or not. And I did. So we went and played a while. And I thought, man, his house is sort of run down. But it didn't bother me. I thought, this guy is nice. And I think I had only seen black people at that time or heard about them on the news. And all that was fighting. But when I saw one in real life, wow, my heart kicked in and my parents wisdom and Christianity kicked in, their faith and respect for all kinds of people. So I honor them. When I went back to, when I grew up and we moved to this small town, I remember my mother, my, they had a church. They would call it the church field and then they taught school. So she would come up during the nine months of the school calendar and, and keep me and then maybe later my sister when she was born. And so she was different. She was very dominating but loving and nurturing and very kind and tireless to serve our family a christian also so i remember mahjan and i would go off to have a little play date away from the family she'd take me out we'd go to the store go to the they didn't have malls we'd go out take the bus line go to eat at woolworths downtown and you know, all the things of the day so one day we went out with her mahjan i was holding her in her hand and went to this group of stores and I saw these signs and they said colored only white only and the bathroom said the same thing colored only white only and I went what is that and see I didn't know about those things because my parents were not like that so when I found out what they said and what they meant I was shocked even as a five or six year old I went I couldn't believe why because God knew that I had a heart for people of all colors but it was his grace. See, a little cut, a little kid will know by their discerner perceiver what's going on, good or bad, mean or ugly or loving, bigoted or not, because they're not soaked in the soil of the world yet. Their hearts are open. Their discernment is is clear. They're not exposed to Pharisees or thou shalt nots or do gooderism, phoniness or whatever. They've got that open heart, spirit, which God wants us to keep open and pure. So blessed are the pure in heart. That's what it says many, a little child shall lead them. Well, many a little child has had to lead people when they were so scarred and damaged and cynical that God would bring a little kid around to show up with himself. So let's do that. When I went to uh, college, I had a really long blonde hair back in the day, blue jeans, you know, Jesus person. And so I had my long hair to my waist, and my roommate had long, sort of curly reddish hair, iron-colored reddish hair. So we both decided we would. God wanted us to tutor down in the heart of the city, so we went to an all-black school. Well, when I went in, I noticed that the little kids were just staring at our hair, and they loved touching my hair. <laughs> and so I thought that was so cool, but was really more, even more cool was that we had a great time. Love the kids, felt their love back. But when one day I went to get my 2T, Vanessa, I believe her name was, about second grade, I went to the door to get her, and I had my long blonde hair, you know, the only white face around. And I walked to the door, and this little kid opens the door, and she says, I said, I'm here for Vanessa. And she said, oh, are you her sister? And see, that also struck me as amazing that here she didn't see color either at that point because they're still open. They're still not jaded and scarred by demonic racism. So let's learn from this. So the idea is that nobody, you know, you can either harm a person and, and cause them to have a skewed relationship, poor art, Poor decisions and discernment from their youth up. Little kid, up. if you surround them with criticism, being grouchy, disrespect, dis dishonoring your mother, demeaning with technology that does the same, with media that does the same, there is a good word from the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
they shall see God more easily, more readily, more quickly, more accurately, and they'll be able to have the joy of the Lord. You know, over in Hebrews 1, 9, I just love this verse, takes me back. You know, it says, oh, in two verses that have changed my heart a lot, that, you know, it says, Jesus Jesus had the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows. That means that no matter what problems, what heaviness, what demonic warfare, because, you know, he was the savior. He could perceive the atmosphere of the eternal realm. And, and he was surrounded with poor people and lepers and all sorts of things. It was a pre-Christian time. Cruelty and slavery, all those things. It said that in Hebrews 1, 9, that Jesus... The prophet, office prophet, it said that he had the oil of joy, oil, oil of joy and gladness above his fellows. That means when he walked down the street, and Jesus wasn't good looking. He wasn't a famous good looking fellow. He was sort of plain and and just unlovely. The Bible teaches. So he'd walk down the street, but he'd have a countenance of joy, of real joy. And it says why in Hebrews one nine. It says because. He hated iniquity and loved what was righteous. The Lord anointed him with the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows, his the other people, his ministers even. And I thought, you got to explain right now what, what iniquity is. People are so hyper-accused and beaten down by Bible beaters, Bible thumpers. So I'm thinking it said that Jesus hated iniquity. He had what the sin and the carnal nature of the human life without him, his wisdom, would do to people. How it would hurt them and shame them and scar them and abuse them and kill them off too young. He hated the power of sin. He hated iniquity, but he didn't hate the sinner and he wasn't self-righteous. He wasn't an accuser of self-right, you know, self-righteousness accused. People perceive that accusation, holier than thou spirit part of pride all right the other part is he hated iniquity but he loved righteousness yet he wasn't self-righteous he wasn't an accuser he loved righteousness god's opinion own he valued the hope the glory the eternal realm he he just was all for that positive hopeful keeping on keeping on going because he knew what was on the other side heaven to gain. When we think of another wonderful trait about Jesus, because, you know, if you have joy, it affects your relationships. If you have the fear of the Lord, which he did, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3, are about the Messiah and the seven spirits of God, how he had the oil of joy, but he had the peace, pay, uh, he had, excuse me, he had the, um, he had all the power, but no accusation, no fear in him. And the holy fear of the Lord, as they 11, 2, and 3. Anyway, back to this. It says that even with all the seven spirits of power, even with the hope of the gospel, the good news, let's try to keep it good news. Even with all his eternal wisdom, even with the warfare, Jesus said, he said, the Bible says, excuse me, that Jesus Christ increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. That means that even though Jesus was born in the manger, he still had to grow up. He still had to get more seasoned and wised and accustomed to the world. He had to adjust and hear his father more. He had to get a physical as well as emotional and <coughs> maturity, you know, spiritual maturity growing up. And even though he was precocious, wise beyond his years, and he honored his mother... A primary relationship. God had to wait till he was ready, but he also had to wait till the people were ready, God's people and the house of God, the Pharisees were ready in the temple before he let him reveal who he really is or was. So we look at Jesus and it says that it took time, a progress, a process. Jesus increased in wisdom and and in stature, and in favor. You can increase in favor, because if Jesus needed to increase in favor, certainly you and I do more. So Jesus had to increase, so do we do. Jesus increased in wisdom, supernatural godly wisdom, the ability to draw on it, discern it, 
use it. He increased in statue. Of course, he grew up taller, but also his confidence in his ministry, who he is. You know, he knew who he was more and his ability to deal with people in business and in ministry and in life. And then he grew up also in favor. Blessed and favor is like a protection. You can pray for favor and you can pray that you have favor in the society, favor with yourself, favor with God, favor with your mother, favor with people, favor because that is a power. It says favor is as a shield that you can be wrapped in favor as a shield. That's a whole nother teaching for, but you can Google, just Google like I did. I do this every so often. Just Google scriptures, Bible favor, Bible scriptures, favor, and you'll get tons of them. Just peel them out there, print them off, copy them and meditate on the ones that you feel are really God is drawing you to. That's going to change your life. You know, the Bible teaches us that in James, excuse me, third John one and two. The Bible says, a beloved, above all things, I want you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So what is your soul? That's your mind, will, and emotions, your mortal soul. And I think of it like a big well. So what you put in your well, mind, your will, and emotions is going to affect you for your health and your money and your prosperity, your contentment over time. I don't believe in quick fixes. I know there can be fast miracles, suddenlies, but I'm for the long haul. We're for the long haul progress as unto the Lord. Every day is valuable 24-7, living it out 365. There's a principle on that as well, that living it out 365, it's like the prophet Enoch. He walked and talked with God daily, and one day God just came and took him. That's Adam's grandson in Genesis 5. So if we say, well, you know, back in the day when I first knew of the Lord, I didn't know that many people that right now are doing the same thing, walking and talking with God 24-7 practically every single day, 365. Now there's a whole, I don't want, it's a movement. It's a Christian subculture that nobody probably knows about it or thinks about it that much. But there's a whole bunch of people doing that. And I believe that's a sign of the Enoch generation that one day God's going to come and take us suddenly when we know it not. So be prepared. Get everyone final day ready. F-D-R. Final day ready. See, the idea of Jesus, well, first of all, I wasn't raised around a clique ministry. I wasn't raised around a subculture of do-gooderism. So therefore, I feel awkward. I, I'm prone to feel awkward when I get out in these religious systems and their bigotry or bias, chauvinism, or, you know, everybody's got to sit like waiting for the pearl to fall from the prophet's you know, mouth, and they don't think for the, they don't have a noble Berean heart to really make sure they're hearing right, not just swallowing everybody's information, he or she. And there are people that you know are confident you can trust them, and I'm for that. I really am. But then there may be a doctrine that God points out, you know, they're, they're right in so many things, and they're not really meaning that, but they might be off. And I think that's where I got, where God has revealed Western European Levitical patriarchism. I think they got a lot of good going, a lot of great over there, some places. But when it gets down and mixes the good about Holy Spirit, apostles and prophets, you know, I love that topic, music and everything. But if they get off and they get a critical nature and they get lopsided, where they're off seeing dark devils on Christians and attacking people they don't have any relationship, accusing people back under the law, they can be as well-meaning as they want to be. But you know what? Unless they, if they accuse them and they don't assess them and they accuse them based on the law or their own prophet's doctrine, house doctrine, they're off. They're really off. And that's why I have a zeal for the father's house because I got some, I learned the hard way about this, not being around that. And then I got jumped several times through the years and it made me study their doctrine. And that's when I found whelp. They call it shepherding, overseer shepherding, basically, in the subculture of this. But I call it whelp because it it stems from Western European, usually Levitical patriarchs and matriarchs. And I studied the culture of Levi, the Levi who was raised middle 
child of six in a chaotic, dysfunctional, even misogynist, anti-woman home because he was disrespectful of his mother, who was Leah, the doe-eyed, unattractive, and she was not favored, and he was the middle child of her group. Plus, there is contention and rivalry in the two women, Rachel and Leah, because they vied to have more children for the husband's attention, Jacob. And instead, they even... They went as far as to hire, to get their handmaidens to sire children for both so they could win the competition. So that uneven keel, that culture of maybe chauvinism, disrespect for leader women, females in general, is there. And that, that to me is part of, well, the accuser of women. And if you read Isaiah 11, excuse me, if you read 1 Samuel 1, the Levi temple, high priesthood, that accuser, whelp, really not well, but, you know, Middle Eastern, Melp, Levitical Patriarch, he tolerated his sons, e- Eli the high priest, the chauvinist high priest, tolerated his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, using the women with, that came to the temple, and he never set them down. Therefore, it shows he didn't respect women. And when Samuel's, the mother of Samuel to be, they didn't know that. But when this lone woman comes and her shoulders are shaking and she's muttering something, it turns out she's grief because she's persecuted under warfare. The same chauvinism, you know, anti-accuser priest, not into relationships, not in the fear of the Lord, not respecting women equally with men, looks over there, sees her shaking and brushes her off with an accusation for a moment. And he says, oh, she's drunk, probably implying I'm a middle-aged priest. I've been around this ministry. I've seen a lot in my years. I've seen it all. I'm worn down. I don't need one more time-wasting, overly emotional, troublesome female who's probably drunk, probably in rebellion, in her home to her husband, not under any my kind of authority. Well, thank God he gets up and he goes over and he does change and he prophesies over her and turns out this woman is grieving her husband loves her. He knows she's there. She's just under great warfare, being demeaned and persecuted for years by the other wife, Penina. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes on Eli, and he gives her a prophecy. And guess what? She turns out to be the mother, be chosen to be the mother of the first prophet of the nation of Israel, Samuel. So let's watch relationships. This is that first two chapters, really the whole first the whole book is a relationship theology. Huge deal. When you study whose relationship does what and why and where. Amazing. So we're trying to bring it down to natural life, practical, where mantle meets other mantle, where mantle meets non-mantle, where mantle meets himself or herself by themselves and the Lord. And then also bring in the fear of the Lord. You know, in my teaching, in my day, I've never seen the absence of the fear of the Lord in the Christian ministry till I moved to the relocation now. I have never, I've never, what are the doctrinal gaps? That's all I can think. So let me tell you how to do it. If you're a Christian, make sure you teach on it. Make sure you're thorough and you're, you've got all of Bible counsel, not just about good manners or how to pay your tithe or showing up at church and doing your duty every week. You've got to teach it all, and that's relationship theology. It means the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. If you Google fear of the Lord, it'll say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in a nation, in the church, in a ministry. Therefore, the absence is the beginning of what? I hate to say foolishness. The other part is, how do you get it? The scripture is Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. It says in a paraphrase, if you seek the Lord and want his wisdom and him more than you do making money, that means silver or gold, then you're going to find it and the fear of the Lord. So think on that, read it for yourself and get your online Bible out, Proverbs 2, 1 through 5 and teach it. We're going to see, we're going to be picking apart some of the doctrinal teaching fine points that are influencing influencing ministry today, fellowshipping today, and home today, and relationships. Also, in the body of Christ, with our mothers and fathers, ourselves, with God. And then, once we get it down, 
if we try to get it down, we can do it with other ministries and we can get it to Ephesians 4 where everybody's on the same page in community. Everyone is on a Christian same page where they believe 100% or not. That's why James 3.17 is good in case you disagree to keep that fruit going so you preserve the relationship easily and treated, respectful. But we can know our common doctrine of Ephesians 4 that says everyone from pioneering preacher, fivefold ministry, male or female, down to the home, down to the business, grassroots, if you're a Christian, born again Christian, it says everyone walk in meekness and lowliness and long suffering with one another in your relationships, in your pioneering ministry, and you'll be pleasing to God. Also, it says there are, there are common doctrines so that everyone will at least know what a real Christian is or should be. They are one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all. And then the rest, like Paul in commands, thou shalt not, are to be held everyone accountable. We don't want to eliminate any jot or tittle of any part of the Bible. And I'm not, but I'm pointing out how to not have accuser demeaning legalism at the local focus. So up at the top of onlinefellowship.us and dfwleader.org, if you can find that menu, you can find a PDF download of what's the difference between the common doctrine and those people who use Pauline commands back under the law to club people, gossip about them, ruin their names, and put on a big act. And so the common doctrines are, if you're a real Christian, you know one Lord, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. One Lord, one faith, the Christian faith only. One baptism, baptism in water as a symbol of a washing of your sin. You can also say the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But one Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Not all people are going to go for the baptism, even though I'm for it. Not, we're realistic. We're not going to club people and hurt them if they don't believe all that. All right. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all. And isn't that amazing? It isn't as hard as you think as you really think. So let's look at online fellowship at the top. Common doctrine of Ephesians 4. It deals with what kind of music you have, how long, if you wear hair and buns, if you don't wear slacks, if you do, if you don't believe in this, that, and the other, if you baptize in Jesus' name only or not. I mean, there's so many little pet peeves out there amongst the believers in the pioneering envy. We want to put it out there for you to think about as sila, as doctrinal teaching fodder, perhaps. And uh, we have to weed out what our daddies taught us. That's good. Pick out what is hay. Throw out what is stubble. Why am I teaching? You know, why are we saying all this? Because it's a disaster. The front lines is a toxic family disaster in the nation at the grassroots level, the barista fellowship level. They're really great people. Some of them are wonderful and not like that. A lot of them. But if you deal with the people who say they are former Christians or people who are spouting their you know lips off with the F word all the time. If you look at the nation, there's a distrust of the Christian, of the one that says they're born again. If you look at the Christian, there's a distrust, if they're a Christian even, of the female. The Christian church basically does not respect. You know, I used to, the black people are not like that. The brown skinned people are usually the, I'm accustomed to having great favor with them. And the ones who are not Levitical patriarch are much nicer and much, you know, more respectful. But I'm saying this is a teaching point, a fine tuning point for relationships. We need to, these are all relationships I'm talking about. I'm not being critical. I'm assessing, not accusing that this is fact, repeated fact. And I've taught for how many years? 40 years. I've taught on relationship theology after relocating to the DFW area for the first time in my life, have I ever been this direct or felt I needed to or had to be because people don't get you. They're that tough. And where they're tough, they can be that mean. Not everyone, but as a newbie, as not a club member and not a Levitical patriarch matriarch and not into. And I guess I do have high esteem. I mean, I don't I try not to be vanity, but I've back when I before I went through a lot of horrible heartbreak. The Lord really taught me, and I've never taught on it. He just said, Tavo, I don't want you to have your esteem in anybody, anything, any possession in your life except me. Not your ministry, not the size of it, not being a Christian, not being uh, owning a house or a car or not or two. 
club member. I don't want you to have anything as your esteem except me. So I have Jesus as the source of my esteem. And maybe I think that might offend quite a few. I didn't realize it. But see, Jesus is enough for me. And whether I have a minute, do ministry, quote unquote, or not, doesn't matter to me. Whether I preach, I don't care. I'll preach anyway. Whether I have a car or house or not, I, I mean, really, I'm in the Lord and it is the fruit frankly, of a happy family from a you know, happy camper, a Christian point of view from my family, but also know the Lord that well through the years. And I also know scripture in First Timothy, it says godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I've got great gain. I'm saying it. I got great gain. I'm not going to be moved by you and your power, your persona, your people-pleasing, your performance, your powerful message, or your pitiful message. I'm going to be moved by, <clears throat> like Paul said, Paul helped me all these years. Paul said, <clears throat> I don't want to know anything about anybody except Christ and Him crucified. That's where my earth suit teaching comes in. For years ago when I was working with, you know, God used me with racial healing, reconciliation among ministers all my life since the 80s. And I thought, why are people biased? What's the, what causes that? As a Christian, what would cause this? So I started to think, well, Paul said, I don't want to know anything. I don't want to perceive or gauge anything, assess or accuse anything. I want to see only by the Spirit, are they a Christian or not? Do they really believe in the Christ that is crucified and risen or not? And I'm going to go by that as my basis for fellowship. And I started thinking, that's great for racism. It also is like faith. Those in the faith, Christian faith movement, faith is not moved by what you see on the outside, what you hear, what you heard from other people, the media, even your own self. It's moved only by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And those two scriptures help me with my teaching that I do right now. And I honor those movements. My parents' movement... And, I, you know, Billy Graham, that type of era in the Christian sense, denominational. And I honor the faith people because I live by faith. I'm not under them. I'm not a Christian who says I'm only word of faith. But I'm saying I honor spiritual fathers of different movements. And I will honor others at different times. But I want to give that you can, if you call these people names or evil, write them off because you've heard of bad stories or the media or all this flagrant living that people twist their their focus from the original top owner on down and they make it a big showcase. That's them doing it, not their basically their doctrine. And so I think you can have a lot of godly contentment and live by faith and not be materialistic, greedy, covetous, or having to look like you're putting on a show to be Mr. Big Shot or Miss Big Shot. And so you can take... What is real faith? That means you just believe what God says. You believe what his word works and you do what he says. And there's some different teachings on that. But it really troubles me when I've heard through the years, people, pastors, get up. I've known people and quit fellowshipping with them, frankly, that would get up when I was there and I had a guest and they would just lambast the faith people and they would do it on their broadcast to call them, you know, all these, they name them by names. And I thought, you know what, that is so un. Christ-like because the Bible says, Matthew eighteen fifteen Galatians 6, 1, if you see somebody in sin, you're supposed to get off your high horse, get on the phone and go make an appointment, talk to them about it. And if they don't listen, take somebody with you. I wonder if they do that con confrontation or if it's just easier to char character assassinate from their own private home or private pulpit or on radio. Is one of my pet peeves about this nation proud so I think walk humbly let us walk humbly know our Ephesians for common doctrine know that people will get off that will get off you'll get off I'll get off but God help us with us all let us go back and repent we need to and then get in with the Lord and start all over again and this not not this time be bold and courageous but not such big shots so we're submitting a lot of peaceful things I hope that will help people talk about it, think about it, really work out their own salvation by being a doctrinal Berean, and then work on our own art, abiding relationship theology, 
abiding in James 3.17 fruit, even under pressure, real life, on and off the stage, and also know that we've already won Revelation 11, excuse me, Revelation 12, 7 through 11, the church, they overcame him, who's him, the accuser, backbiter, deceiver, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their life unto death. You know, my dad and mom were not, you know, that was back in years ago. Nobody said, Tavo, we're going to work on relationship theology. That was God's grace. He just gave that to me a few weeks ago, a few months ago. The, I was writing about it, gelled, and all of a sudden, by God's grace, I saw, look, it's abiding relationship theology, and it says art, and it is an art. You can have to have dark arts, manipulation, witchcraft control, false power, false teaching. You can have cunning and slick you know, all that type of thing, manipulation, doctrines even. But it's an art. Abiding relationship is like an artist. The artist has to step back and examine the work and be sensitive and intuitive and cautious and joyful and celebratory, but also it takes an art. There are two books that are art through the years, The Art of War, which is the Chinese famous classic. I haven't read it. But see, there's art. It's that sensitive skill that God can needs to enhance and give us more strength to do that, more born discerning and helpful, that we're not back under the law, that type of thing. All right, well, then there's another book, The Art of the Deal. We know. Do you know who wrote that? We won't mention that name. A famous person we all should recognize who happens to be a president somewhere. Anyway, the art of the deal, well, you know, I'm not going to look at, I don't do politics, but I'm looking at the title. It is art to do this. You have to have a certain kind of smarts. I won't say anything, but you also have to be cautious not to do manipulation, the bad kind of art when you're selling things, con artist style. So the art is a big deal. But the art, abiding relationship, theology, or any kind of art, the art of selling, the art of artistry, the art of being a mom, the art of being a nice person is not the same without the fear of the Lord, the holy fear of the Lord, without a discernment between the holy and profane, the difference between goodness and evil, the difference between strife and enduring love, the difference between fault finding and, and assessing. There's so many fine tuning things and that's our ministry to point out there is a difference. The difference between complaining and contention and contending for the faith. That's a big one. Jude, contending for the faith, ties in with what we do. We're doing now. We're reproving and correcting. Where does that come from? That comes from my foundational verse from the 80s when I first got the call to a real public ministry. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, that the Bible is the inspired word of God, profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for reproof, and for correction, so that the man and woman of God, the human of God, will be profitable in every good work. God wants you to be profitable, but it'll take some adjustments. It'll take getting things under control in a godly sense and giving up control to God more. A lot more. So we're going to teach on this, but this is Tevo DRC signing off from Tevo Creative Leadership, Abiding Relationship Theology. We really want to have fun with this. We want to have ongoing, you know, there's warfare, but we want to have the joy of the Lord. We want to have the strength of the Lord, but we want to have that godly, that like Jesus, the godliness, the joy of the Lord above our fellows, Hebrews 1, nine. So pray for me as I really don't have a outlet for just getting away from this area and I really need that. And it's been some big, scary stuff. But you know what? Because I know God, I handle it real well. God has taken care of me all my life. But there have been some people that were not real nice, not real honest, that have tried to, you know, do some things to me, taking advantage. So we're going to keep on going, but we keep on going no matter what. We've also found some great starter groups that are really not back under the law. We like to fellowship. So if you know of other places or you need good places, let me know as well. We also would like to, um, my ministry is to 
say, I'll be here, but I don't want to be over you, but I will be like a pastor, mentor to those who want that by divine appointment if I accept you. <laughs> because I'm not playing around. This is not playtime for me. This is going, and I'm going to be moving around and I can still keep in touch with the internet, Skype, all that type of thing. Technology is amazing. And there is no charge. It's free. But if you feel it, if you are connected, you would want to, of course, donate. That's part of the biblical, biblical method. You, you know, you offer tithes, offerings, and to the leader that you sit under that trains you, that's part of it. And if you feel that now, go right ahead. Because we are for the Lord and we're for the body, but because we're so unique and a woman does this, apostle woman, it is not well thought of by a lot of people who are men run only. And it is the Levitical patriarch streak in America that has been the worst nightmare. Like I said, I was spoiled I was raised, and I didn't ever wasn't around that. I didn't know women thou shalt not. I didn't know women are accused. I didn't know women's were looked down on and chattel and Jezebels and accused by the devil himself through ministers. I didn't know that. Therefore, I teach against it so that everyone else can be free also. I'm liberated. I was raised by God's grace. I'm, I was raised, I'm raised liberated. These people are trying that accuser spirit, that de demon unclean demon against women and fault finding is trying to put me back under the law where they are or where they were. Hopefully they're out now. God bless you. He loves you. Have a great day today. The joy of the Lord is all our strength. Read Psalm 118. That's our version of ministry. That Psalm 118 is, is what a person lives through through the years. You'll find yourself in every one of those situations practically. Dire straits, Shouting in the joyful tents of the righteous, all sorts of things with God's mercy enduring forever. God loves you. Have a great day. This is Tavo from Tavo Creative Leadership signing off for now. If you need to contact DFW Leader at gmail.com. God bless you.